there are all types of opportunities throughout the scriptures to find instances in which we find parallels to a great extent to what we are experiencing physically here upon this earth. If we're experiencing birthdays, then we find somebody in the Bible who is a, having a birthday, and whether it be one that's relatively small or whether it be one that's great length, then there's all types of applications that we can make relative to birthdays. We can also do the same relative to marriages, to, to graduations, to funerals, to so many different things. But only once a year do we have the opportunity to go to the Bible and find examples that will assist us as we begin a new year. Most of us, even though we might be working in the world of business and on a physical year, most of us figure to our affairs of life that they are tied directly to the fact that January begins an opportunity to accomplish things that we never did get around to accomplishing last year, to do things that we did not get a chance to do last year, to set our house in order when we never did get around to setting our house in order last year, to become a Christian, to begin to live the Christian life because we Never got around to doing that last year. To return into the fold of safety after wandering away and being lost because we never did get around to doing that last year and on and on and on we go. But while we can find and, and see so many principles that apply to us, if we simply look at the principles and do not make any application of them, it ain't going to help one bit. Therefore, it's incumbent that each and every one of us, as individuals, do what we can to apply some of the principles that we're going to be looking at this morning as it directly relates to the challenge that is before us for this congregation to be all that it can be by everyone participating and jointly working for the cause of Christ in this community that happens to use this building from time to time. Yes, friends and brethren, I'm talking about the Lord's Church at Dunlap. And while it may be the case that there are visitors in our midst today, and certainly there are, that are not members of this congregation, I guarantee you the principles that we look at will have direct bearing on you too, because... If you're not a Christian, you have the obligation to become one. If you are, and yet working in some other area, these are principles that apply directly to your work wherever you may be, even in lower Alabama. And so as we look at these things and see that in a very real sense, we are experiencing a transition time. Could not help, as I was putting this lesson to go, to think about the possibility of Kate being with us today for the first time in so, so many years because of her being the help meet for her dear husband, our dear brother, TJ, and what they've experienced together over the years and how that they've grown closer together over the years and how they've grown spiritually over the years, even though they were to a great extent excluded from what we're able to do here. Transition time. Everybody experiences it. In one way or another. What do we do with it? Well, we've got an example before us that, of course, finds its footing, at least, in our devotional reading of two months ago. While it was, in fact, a transition time, Moses is dead. His right-hand man the man that God has chosen to lead the children of Israel into that land flowing with milk and honey, Joshua is now the main guy. He is the one 
to whom the people must look because he now has this tremendous responsibility of leading a nation of people conservatively estimated at two and a half million people into the promised land. How'd you like to have a job like that? No cell phone, no email, only a round form to call a simple. It's tough. And while it was, in fact, the transition time, friends and brethren, proven over and over and over again, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You see, you can look at that statement, which is, in fact, expressive of the biblical principle for sure. You can look at that and see negative connotations all over. And, of course, you're the same person that would look at a glass of water and say that it's half empty. Or you can look at that statement and see within it all types of possibilities. I mean, if indeed it is the case that the more things change, the more they stay the same, then sooner or later, if we apply ourselves to wisdom, then we're going to learn how to deal with matters because there's nothing new under the sun. It simply becomes incumbent upon me to become more aware and more capable of dealing with the same types of things because they are the same types of things day in and day out just as it was the responsibility of Joshua, it is the responsibility of us as well. He had a simple little prescription given by God. I want you to do all that I commanded my servant Moses. Do according to all the law. Don't turn to the right hand. Don't turn to the left hand. Stay right with God's will. Now, friends, that principle is a principle that while it might appear to be ancient, and while it might appear to be something that would be said to a man who's leading an army of people in a barren land into a land that's full of milk and honey, the principles of that statement find direct application to each and every one of us. We know that a thousand, fifteen hundred years later, it was in actuality repeated by Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 16 to verse 19. Specifically on this occasion, to a man by the name of Peter, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The principle there, bound things cannot be tampered with. Stay with the truth. Things that are not bound, leave them alone. Because they are not bound in heaven, therefore, they are not to be bound upon earth. But do not make the sad mistake of mixing those two categories of things up. Don't treat bound matters as if they are unbound matters, and don't treat unbound matters as if they are bound matters. Later on, Jesus made this same statement to all the apostles in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 18. Whatsoever they would bind on earth would have already been bound in heaven. And whatsoever things that they would loose on earth would have already been loosed in heaven. Friends, when the apostles stood up on the day of Pentecost and told people who cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They did not call a powwow and say, What are we going to tell them? What are we going to tell them? They feel the enormity of killing the Son of God. What are we going to tell them to do? Have you got any ideas, James? What about you, Peter? What do you think, John? What are we going to say? No. What they said had already been settled in heaven. And they simply made it known first on that occasion. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That had already been settled in heaven. And it was not only settled in heaven for Pentecost Day in Acts chapter 2, it was settled in heaven for this day, January the 2nd, in the year 2011. What must I do to be saved? That's settled in heaven, friends. The same thing required in the first century is required today. Because 
What it made a person in the first century is what it makes a person today. A Christian. A member of the body of Christ. A citizen in the kingdom of God. With all the rights and the privileges that goes along with being one who can call upon his Father, which art in heaven. And that's the only thing we have right to say today. So while things change, they do stay the same as well. Now notice. Some of these encouraging things that God provides for Joshua. First, he makes mention of the fact that the land into which they are going is a promised land. It is a land that has been promised all the way back to the days of Abraham. Abraham was told specifically, you're not going to be able to enjoy the pleasures of this land, but your descendants will. When the iniquity of the Amorites is full, when there are no redeeming characteristics of the people that live in this land, then your descendants will go into this land and they will have it for a possession. God promises Joshua that that's going to come to pass. God also promises that he's going to be with him. Someone says, boy, wouldn't it have been wonderful to have lived in a period of time in which God promised to be with you. Boy, wouldn't you like to go back there where we would know that God was with us? Hopefully nobody thinks like that. Let me tell you something, friends and brethren. If I did not know that God is with us right now, I would not be doing or being where I am right now. If God is not with us in what we have determined to do as a congregation in this coming year, we ain't got no business even thinking we can do it. Because God is with us, we know we can do it. Not by our own might, not by our own initiative, not by our own wisdom, but as God blesses us to do what we can do. Mark it down. God has never expected out of anybody anything they couldn't do. But He's always promised that if we'll do what we can do, He will bless us as He's with us to do more than we can imagine. One thing's for sure, if we don't do what we can do, we ain't going to get to do anything else. God is with Joshua. Friends and brethren, God is with us too. How do we know that? Because God keeps His word. God keeps His word. God keeps His promises. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine: The Lord is not slack concerning His promises; some men count slack. But is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repent. You mean when God makes a promise, then and that's a promise you can count on? That's a, that's a promise that's sure? Yeah. Well, well, can't man make promises like that? No, he can't do it. Even the best of men make promises that they do not keep. And it's not because they become dishonest men either, it's because they cannot tell the future. The example that I give all the time, I've let my mule out to so many people that I forgot how many times I have. I promise somebody's wanting to turn their garden for some reason. Well, it's a new year. I guess we might as well get ready to put some peas in the ground. Somebody wants to turn their garden tomorrow. I promise them that they can borrow my mule to turn their garden tomorrow. And yet, overnight, somebody steals my mule. Guess what? There ain't nobody going to be turning their garden with my mule tomorrow. Why? Because it's been stolen. But you promised he could use it. God's promises are not like that. God's promises are not contingent upon everything landing just exactly right. When God makes a promise, his promise comes true. And the assurance here in the last verses, verses 6 through 9 to Joshua is that God is going to keep His Word. I want you to notice something else here in these passages because these are principles that apply to us just as well. 
And I'm talking about the tenses of verbs that are used. In verse 2, the land which I do give. Verse number 3, the land that I have given. Verse number 6, to this people you shall divide this land that I have given. Now, wait a minute. Where are they at? When God is making these promises, they're not even across the Jordan River yet. Oh, you're sure they can see over into the promised land, but they're not even there yet. They've not whipped all the armies of the Canaanites. There's a powerful heathen soul that lives in the land. They have a large confederacy of ungodly kings in these city-states. And yet God speaks of it as if it is now. How can He do that? He's already given them away. And all they have to do is step out on faith and take it. Oh, I wish we lived in a period of time in which we had such assurances of that, don't you? I wish that God made promises to us that we could just take as if they were so right now. That's what every bit of this is about. The promises that He makes are promises that simply need us to step out on faith and do it. That is the hindering characteristic. Our failure to step out by faith and claim that which is ours. Remember in Joshua chapter 2, Joshua has sent two spies into the land. He learned a lesson about don't send too many spies into the land because some of them will probably bring back a bad report and it will hinder you for 40 years. You'll wander in the wilderness because of faithless spies. And so, he determines 12 spies is too many. Joshua and Caleb, one, two, two spies be plenty. And so he sends two spies to spy out the city of Jericho. Of course, they find lodging in the house of a harlot by the name of Rahab, and all that's involved in that. And then after this trek of sending these two spies into the city, the two spies come back to Joshua, and notice what they say. Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, and even for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. Do you remember 40 years earlier, or really 39 years earlier, when those 12 spies had gone in the land? Remember when they came back, their report was this. It truly is a land that flows with milk and honey. I mean, this is a fine place, this came. They got the best garden, the best orchard, the best vineyard. I mean, look at this cluster of grapes. They, it took two of them to carry a cluster of grapes that hung down between them. Can you imagine that? But the inhabitants of the land are powerful, strong people. They're giant. We look like grasshoppers in their sight, and they look upon us as nothing more than a bunch of pets, as grasshoppers too. Who said that? The ten spies who were faithless that said, we're going to get killed. Well, what did Joshua and Caleb say? Joshua and Caleb said, yes, there are giants in the land. All of the things they said about the vegetation, wonderful, wonderful things. But because God had said, this is your land to take, they shall not be able to stand before you. Joshua and Caleb said, Let us rise up and take the land, for we are well able. You know what you call that? You call that believing that God is telling you the truth and then working in accordance with what He says. That's what you call it. Why do people have such great difficulty with that? 
simply believing that God is telling the truth. And when we talked about this morning in our, in our class, uh, and possibly in y'all's class as well, about the reason for there having to be this promised seed of woman to come and destroy the works of the devil. It's because Eve believed the lie of the devil rather than believing what God is saying. She didn't believe that God was telling her the truth. What is it about not believing that God is telling the truth? And I know there's always been more people that believe God was trying to pull one over on them than those who believe that God is telling the truth. Shouldn't be that way. But that's the way it is, nonetheless. We're well able to take the land. Down through the years, there have been people who would fail to stand up and be counted for what's right was for fear of what other people would say or think about them. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, we read of the faithless and the unbeliever. The coward and the unbeliever is the one who will not possess the land of Canaan and one who will not possess heaven one day. Then in Joshua chapter 3, notice what happened. Joshua rose up early in the morning. They removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. What are we talking about here? They are getting ready to go across this body of water once again. What body of water this time? It's not the Red Sea. It's the Jordan River. And it's flood stage. The, perfect, the procession in which they're going to go across the Jordan River on dry ground is here specified in that there's going to be about 3,000 feet between the Ark of the Covenant, which pictures for them the presence of God and the people. Come not near and dead, that is the Ark, that ye may know the way by which you must go for ye have not passed this way heretofore. Wait a minute. You've never been in this position right here before, huh? They have. Have you? Did you know that you have never been right here in this position before? Oh, I mean, you've been in situations similar. But you've never experienced the, the first Sunday in the year 2011 before. Never have. But just as the children of Israel are going to learn, and, and likewise we need to learn as well, it doesn't matter whether it's the beginning of the year 2011 or the beginning of the year 2020. The principles will remain the same. They had not been this way before. And since they had not been this way before, they would not been in this position before, then they need to realize some things for sure. Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Well, let's notice. In order for this great passing over the Jordan River to take place, the first thing that is specified for the people to do is to sanctify themselves. Well, I dare say there is one of them there religious words that maybe causes confusion in people's minds. Sanctify themselves. I mean, while this is a people who have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, they are the descendants of the unbelieving parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles who have died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. 
And while they may be used to walking around out in the desert, and while they might, may not have any fine clothes like we do, they probably didn't have any idea what a color television ever be or a car to drive around in. The responsibility that rests upon their shoulders in order for them to be able to go across the Jordan River is exactly in principle what we must do if we make it across Jordan into heaven one day. It's got to be sanctified. Well, what does it mean for these people to be sanctified? Well, the word sanctified, you almost see the word in it, they are to be set apart. Not just set apart for the sake of being set apart, but set apart for a holy purpose. The word from which we get sanctified is the same word from which we get holy. Someone says, well, I might be sanctified, but I just don't think I can look upon myself as being holy. Well, the thing is, in the book of Hebrews, we're, said, we're told that if we cannot be holy, then we cannot see God. Therefore, I want to find out what being holy is so I can be it because I want to see God. Don't you? And if these people could not be sanctified and engage themselves in sanctifying themselves, then they're not going to be going across no Jordan River into the land of Canaan. They've got to realize some things. Since they never have been in this position before, God was going to help them be where they can follow his lead across this water. They had to be ready to do it. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you and make it fulfilled. This passage of Scripture teaches that we must sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. That means He must be set apart in our hearts to a position in which our desire is to be able to serve Him acceptably, which involves, in this passage of Scripture, being able to provide an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that's in us will be to fulfill. Somebody says, boy, that sounds like a whole lot of study necessary to do something like that. I mean, be able to answer a question that a person has? If we think that we will be able to fulfill our obligations from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 by simply occupying a pew once a week, we are sadly mistaken. It will only come through study of God's Word. You know, one of those six things that the elders have pictured before us as being a vital need for each and every one of us throughout this coming year, five minutes devotional he said. Five minutes. Folks, think about it. If I would even in the back of my mind think that five minutes that's a, that's a pretty tall order to expect out of me. Five minutes. And don't you know how busy I am? Don't you know how many irons I've got in the fire? Five minutes, that's going to that's gonna really be hard. I mean, when am I going to find five? If we would have difficulty even formulating in our mind an opportunity to segment five minutes a day for me and my family to concentrate on God and His Word as a family unit. If I can't do that, I got problems. And it could very well be that that five minutes could be the very means available to lead me back where I need to be. Five minutes. When you start putting five minutes together, then you end up having half hours, end up having hours, end up having weeks. Sooner or later, we might be in a position 
that we can actually look upon, look upon ourselves as a sanctified people set apart for a holy purpose. That's what they had to be. And that's what we must be as well. The possibility always exists that in an audience of this size, that there may be one or more that never has rendered obedience to the simple command of the gospel has not become a child of God. If you are such a person, let it be known that I didn't come up with a plan of salvation, nor did any man. But God in heaven set forth plainly, as Jesus Christ himself said in John chapter 8, verse 24, If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sin. Now look at that passage of Scripture. And I draw the conclusion from that passage of Scripture that Jesus is saying, I've got to believe that he is God. I've got to. If I don't believe that he's God, I'm lost forever and ever. So if I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then that means that I'm going to be open and receptive to anything and everything that he says relative to my salvation. He says in Luke 13, 3, Repent or perish. That word repent means to turn, means to change your mind, which will result in a changed or reformed life. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, in a city that was full of intellectuals, Paul said, the times of this intellectual idolatry, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he's appointed a day, that's the judgment day, in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, and that man is Jesus Christ, and hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now listen to what Jesus said at Mars Hill. The assurance that we have that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day is the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Just as surely as he did, even so will we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Did Jesus Christ come forth from the grave? Was Jesus triumphant over that? Did he burst forth from the tomb? If so, then I will be resurrected as well. And I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I must be willing to confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And I must be baptized into Christ so that I might enjoy all the blessings spiritually that are contained in the Christ. Live faithful then as a child of God in heaven can be my eternal home. But if I've done that in times past but wandered away, then I need to return and I need to be restored. And through repentance, confession, and prayer, the way back is provided for the erring child of God. Does that describe you? If so, why not remedy that situation this morning? Being restored to right relationship with God, why not become a child of God even right now while we stand and while we sing?